Awesome. So uh, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my PhD defense on the algorithms and applications of novel capsule networks. Um, I want to give a special thank you at first to my committee members, my advisor, Dr. Ulas Bakshi, and Drs. Shaw, Mahal, and Novus, and Wallace. And let's dive on in. So starting in chapter one, I discuss the background and motivation for studying capsule neural networks. This includes laying out briefly their core ideas and what advantages they hold over convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, as motivation for our works. Next, in chapter two, I introduce our first major contribution to capsule networks, where we created the first ever capsule network for performing image segmentation. That leads us into chapter three, where I describe our work on creating a capsule-based network for medical imaging diagnosis and its unique challenges, such as having relatively limited training data and a large degree of intra-class and low inter-class variation. Moreover, biomedical imaging provides us amazing opportunities to create potentially life-saving technologies. Finally, in chapter four, we focus on a key aspect of medical imaging being a high-risk application domain. In high-risk applications, more so than any others, the explainability of models can be a key factor in the adoption of such systems into routine workflows. And we set out to create an explainable network through the encoding of visually interpretable attributes within capsules to deliver, deliver human level explanations. Lastly, in chapter five, we conclude and discuss potential future directions of our work. A brief background about myself. I finished my bachelor's at St. Olaf College in 2016, triple majoring in physics, mathematics, and computer science before being accepted to pursue my PhD at UCF in the CRCV, where I finished my master's along the way in 2019. I held several internships while studying here, including at Lockheed Martin, Armored Things, and Aptiv. Uh, here's a selected list of the publications and patents I've completed since joining the CRCV, including some top venues such as CVPR, Mackay, MIDL, ISB, Medical Image Analysis, and several others. And with that brief aside over, let's dive into the background and motivation. What are capsule networks and what is our motivation for studying them? Convolutional neural networks are doomed. This is a famous quote from Jeffrey Hinton, Turing Award winner and often called the godfather of deep learning, taken from his 2013 lecture series on computer vision as inverse graphics. Now, let's see why Hinton proclaimed this. CNNs have a few major shortcomings, mainly due to the fact that the features in CNNs are represented with scalar values, which are additively combined at every layer. This leads to two major limitations. First, the modeling of internal relationship amongst features becomes ambiguous when we can only sum presence estimations over receptive fields a problem which is made worse by non-overlapping subsampling operations, such as the max pooling operation. Hinton famously said about this, the pooling operation used in convolutional neural networks is a big mistake, and the fact that it works so well is a disaster. We can demonstrate this shortcoming with a quick example. Given this scrambled face as input to a CNN for classification, early works such as Zeiler and Fergus in 2013 show CNNs learn high value localized activations on mid-tier feature maps. Passing these features into higher level layers, we would obtain a feature map which gets classified as a face, despite the input being all jumbled up. And the second and perhaps more important limitation is that CNNs lack the ability to extrapolate to new viewpoints. Since features are represented with scalar values, the only information they can contain is the probability of whether or not a feature is present at a given location. This means we must either replicate our feature detectors across all possible poses of all possible inputs at every single layer, something we can easily see is computationally infeasible, or we train our CNNs in such a way as to become invariant to all possible pose changes of each feature. This lattermost method is typically what is done today through the use of data augmentation. And while it provides some flexibility, it's largely ineffective, as I will demonstrate. So 
So here's a simple demonstration of these issues played out in practice. At left, the network is now even more confident that our disarranged face belongs to a person, while at right, simply rotating the image upside down causes it to be misclassified as coal. In fact, this issue is so extensive that a 2019 study published at CBPR found CNNs fail to recognize 97% of the pose space of objects. Now, capsule networks are an attractive potential solution to these shortcomings in the CNN literature. A capsule network is comprised of capsules, which are defined as a group of neurons representing a feature's presence, and more importantly, the attributes of that feature, often called the feature's instantiation parameters. And these can be anything from pose to deformations to velocity in video to albedo, hue, texture, and many other things. In practice, this only requires two simple changes from convolutional neural networks. First, features are represented by vectors or matrices rather than scalars, and this allows us to store important information about the features being learned. Second, we route this information from one layer to the next via a dynamic routing algorithm, which weights both the presence and internal relationships of the lower level features with respect to each higher level combination. We can illustrate how this solves the previously discussed problems with another quick example. If we take our same jumbled face image and input it to a capsule network, we would obtain vectors whose dimensions contain the instantiation parameters necessary to construct the features they represent. After passing these vectors, now represented here by the reconstructions, to the transformation matrix for the face parent capsule, this produces a set of prediction vectors. Here, each child capsule is making a loud vote that a face should be present, but the pose of that face is in strong disagreement amongst the different children, shown here by the non-overlapping faces. After sending these predictions through the dynamic routing algorithm, this disagreement causes no activation of the face capsule. If instead we input a proper face image, now all the children's votes agree on the pose of the face that should be present. And when combining these predictions in the dynamic routing algorithm, we would observe an activation of the face capsule with the face's instantiation parameters captured as well. And with that understanding of capsule networks, let's examine some of the practical benefits of adopting this framework. Since we're storing richer information about features, and because of the combination of transformation matrices and dynamic routing, we can now generalize our features across pose variations, even to those which are unseen during training. Essentially what we're doing is we're imposing a coordinate frame on our features, and then the multiplication of those features with the transformation matrix equates to a viewpoint change. This means we no longer need to massively replicate feature detectors across pose variations to generalize to new poses of objects, which we demonstrate in one of our published works. Therefore, it follows that we should be able to achieve the same levels of predictive performance of very deep CNNs while only using a small fraction of their parameters due to these much stronger internal representations being learned. In fact, we find this to be true in all of our published capsule works. And thus, in culmination, due to having fewer parameters, and being able to generalize across viewpoints, we should find that capsule networks will require far less data to train while converging significantly faster. In Capsule Networks Against Medical Imaging Data Challenges, the authors show that capsule networks do require less data to train, as well as handling the class imbalances better than CNNs as well. And we observe faster convergence in all of our studies. And that brings us to the research questions at the core of this dissertation. One, how effective are capsule networks in challenging real world applications? And we give specific focus to biomedical imaging applications. And two, what algorithmic advances are needed to make these new applications possible? With those questions in mind, we move into chapter two, where we detail our work on capsule networks for image segmentation which is related to the publications and patent listed at right. The highlight of these is capsules for object segmentation presented at MIDL 2018, 
which received the CIFAR Award for Outstanding Papers and recently passed 110 citations. So let's look at the motivations and challenges for creating a capsule-based segmentation network. First, the equivariant properties of capsule networks lend themselves nicely to the task of segmentation, where precise spatial localization is very important. However, the initial CAPSNet published by Sabur, Frost, and Hinton in 2017 was extremely computationally expensive. Given just a small six by six pixel grid of 32 eight dimensional capsules being routed to 10 16 dimensional capsules for classification, there are nearly 1.5 million parameters. With the task of segmentation requiring far larger input and output sizes, the number of parameters quickly grows out of control making it impossible to fit such models into memory. As an application, we chose pathological lung segmentation with additional experiments conducted on fluorescent angiogram videos and natural images. To solve this memory burden, we introduced two important contributions. First, a locally constrained dynamic routing algorithm to route information to each parent capsule only from a small local neighborhood of child capsules centered on that parent's spatial location. Second, we propose to share transformation matrices across both spatial locations and child capsule types. These two contributions combined reduces the number of parameters in every capsule layer by a significant factor, reducing those needed 2.8 quadrillion parameters to only 324,000. This is the original dynamic routing algorithm from CAPSNET. It creates prediction vectors for every single child capsule for each parent. Each parent is then formed as a weighted sum of predictions with dynamically obtained weights based on the cosine similarity between predictions. In our proposed locally constrained dynamic routing, we only create prediction vectors using a transformation matrix over a local K by K neighborhood of child capsules within each child capsule type for each parent. We then share this transformation matrix across the spatial grid and across child capsule types. Predictions are then weighted and combined using the same cosine similarity based comparison. Another component of the original CAPSNET was a learned inverse mapping from capsule vectors back to inputs as a form of regularization. To construct a similar regularization technique for segmentation, we modify the algorithm to reconstruct all input pixels belonging to the positive input class using the ground truth at training and all capsules whose vector lengths are above a given threshold at testing. This learned inverse mapping forces the capsule vectors to learn the instantiation parameters of objects, while the main loss enforces learning discriminative classification features. This technique shares parallels to work such as VGAN, which learned an inverse mapping to overcome the mode collapse issues in GAN. Putting these three novelties together, we can create our first capsule network for object segmentation, which serves as a baseline for us. You'll notice here the structure is kept virtually identical to CAPSNET, with the dynamic routing swapped out for our locally constrained routing with transformation matrix sharing, and the new reconstruction method added. The images as input and output are from the task of retinal vessel segmentation from fluorescent angiogram videos. Now, while we saw good performance on the retinal vessel segmentation task, Locally constraining the dynamic routing introduces a major limitation. Segmentation as a task is really the joining of two separate tasks solved in unison, recognition and delineation. This is why most successful segmentation frameworks utilize encoder-decoder networks to obtain global information for recognition and local information for delineation. When we constrain the dynamic routing, we lost the ability of capturing global information at every layer. To solve this, we introduced a novel encoder-decoder style capsule architecture by creating deconvolutional capsules. These deconvolutional capsules operate in the same manner as our convolutional capsules, except their prediction vectors are formed using a transposed convolution operation. Now with these five novelties combined, 
namely the locally constrained dynamic routing, transformation matrix sharing, reconstruction regularization for segmentation, deconvolutional capsules, and our deep encoder decoder capsule architecture, we produced the first ever capsule-based segmentation network in the literature called SegCaps. Let's go ahead and walk through the parts of SegCaps. Given an input image, shown here is a 512 by 512 2D slice from a CT scan of a person's chest, we extract global features with a deep encoder branch. Next, the information is passed to a decoder using our deconvolutional capsules with skip connections from the encoder branch to help retain fine-grained localization. After this, we produce a final segmentation by taking the vector magnitudes of our output capsule vectors, while also passing those above the threshold to the reconstruction branch to perform regularization. You'll notice the entire network is comprised of capsules, with the exception of the initial convolution to form the primary capsule and the reconstruction subnetwork. To test our method, we applied seg caps to pathological lung segmentation and retinal vessel segmentation. Now, before detailing our experiments, let's take a quick look at these chosen applications. Pathological lung segmentation is a crucial problem for disease analysis. Automated systems for analyzing diseases such as COPD, the third leading cause of death in the world, lung cancer, which accounts for more deaths than the next three most lethal forms of cancer combined and together forms the second highest cause of death in the United States, and perhaps most important, the current global pandemic, COVID-19, all began with first segmenting lung tissue regions. In fact, we're collaborating right now with the National Institutes of Health and other groups to help analyze thousands of scans for COVID-19. What we have found from our practical experience is that no currently available tool has been able to handle these pathological cases to a high enough degree of accuracy needed for their use in clinical applications. In fluorescent angiogram videos, segmenting retinal vessels plays an important role in identifying pathologies and analyzing blood flow. So to reiterate, nearly all computer-aided diagnosis systems rely on first performing some form of segmentation. So for this work, we performed the largest pathological lung segmentation study in the literature combining five large-scale data sets from both clinical and preclinical subjects. With the goal of creating a general framework, which performs consistently across many different lung diseases and even different anatomies, we conducted experiments on the following data sets. LIDC, containing lung cancer screening patients. LTRC, containing interstitial lung disease, specifically fibrotic, as well as COPD patients. UHG contained 13 different forms of interstitial lung diseases. JHU's TBS, which looks at the effect of smoking inhalation on the development and progression of tuberculosis in mice subjects. And JHU's TB, which looked at the effect of two different experimental treatments on the development and progression of TB in mice subjects. It's worth noting that preclinical image analysis is a particularly challenging area with extremely limited training data due to a lack of expert interest in providing annotations. I myself actually spent over two months annotating data to complement the annotations provided by radiologists. Combining that with the drastically different anatomy and extremely high levels of noise, and it quickly becomes a significantly difficult task. In fact, no works other than uh, Dr. Bakshi's 2015 TMI paper, a semi-automated non-deep machine learning method, exist for preclinical image segmentation. So for all experiments, we compared five methods. UNET, the gold standard for biomedical image segmentation for the last several years. Tiramisu, which is a dense net encoder decoder extension to UNET. PHNN is the state-of-the-art method in pathological lung segmentation. Our baseline SEGCAPS model and our proposed SEGCAPS. Shown in the right-hand column is a comparison of the number of parameters used in each of these networks, where our proposed SEGCAPS contains less than 5% of the parameters at only 1.4 million of a typical UNET architecture. 
These are the results of our experiments. We computed the dice coefficient, which captures the global level overlap of segmentations with the ground truth, and the Hausdorff distance, which captures the local level accuracy of the segmentation boundaries. In clinical and preclinical subjects, SEGCAPS is consistently outperforming all of their methods, despite only using a small fraction of the size of these bigger networks. Since the lungs are such a large portion of the input space, the true comparison and accuracy between methods is best captured by the Hausdorff distance. Where the dice scores are fairly close for all methods, the Hausdorff distance is typically only closely clustered for the CNN-based methods, with SEGCAPS significantly outperforming them for most data sets. This is captured in the qualitative results as well. Here, we are showing the segmentation boundaries for each method and ground truth, with the ground truth shown in magenta and our proposed seg caps in cyan. The numbered and yellow boxed regions are magnified in the space below the full-sized images. The CNN-based networks struggle in areas with similar Hounsfield unit values, that's areas which appear with similar intensities. And this makes them fail in the case of pathologies within the lungs, especially near the tissue boundaries. When looking at the preclinical results, we see a similar effect, where SEGCAPS is staying fairly close to the ground truth magenta line. The CNN-based networks are tending to over or under segment. Even in a particularly challenging case where all networks struggle, SEGCAPS is still coming closest to capturing the proper region. We performed ablation studies on all components of our proposed method. When other networks are reduced to roughly the same number of parameters as SEGCAPs, their performance decreases. We found three routing iterations to perform the best empirically. The proposed encoder-decoder network with deconvolutional capsules performed far better than our baseline SEGCAPs. And the reconstruction regularization did help with the overall performance of our approach. Next, we'll take a quick look at some of our work done on retinal vessel segmentation. These qualitative results demonstrate the superiority of our baseline capsule network over UNET, particularly on thin vessels seen here or crowded vessels seen here. Since this task doesn't require global information, we chose not to use our encoder decoder structure. In the results, areas of cyan are being under-segmented by the method, magenta areas are being over-segmented, and white areas are correct segmentations. UNET struggles with issues of under-segmentation on thin vessel structures and over-segmentation in areas of crowded vessels. Overall, our capsule-based segmentation network achieved consistently better results than UNET. Our last set of experiments examine the ability of SEGCAPs to generalize to unseen poses, an understudied but purported benefit inherent to capsule networks. We overfit UNET and SEGCAPs to 100% training accuracy on a single image, then rotated or reflected that image and fed it into the networks for prediction. UNET struggled to provide good segmentations, while SEGCAPs only saw a minor drop in performance. Shown here in the chart at right, UNET's performance dropped nearly 15%, while SEGCAPs only dropped around 4% on average. To guarantee a fair comparison and ensure the significantly more parameters in UNET had a chance to properly fit, we trained both networks for 10 times the number of epochs past convergence. UNET still struggled to handle these changes in viewpoint, showing nearly the same degree of performance drop, while SEGCAPs handled them again with relative ease, now showing almost no drop in performance. In this chapter, SEGCAPS introduced many important novelties to create the first ever capsule segmentation network. However, there's more to medical imaging applications than just segmentation. The obvious next step is to create a capsule-based network for computer-aided diagnosis, where an end-to-end -end detection and diagnosis system is the ultimate goal. Although capsule networks do exist for classification tasks, there are still some major limitations to overcome for their use in real-world applications. 
And that brings us to chapter three, capsule-based methods for medical imaging diagnosis. This work is related to the publications and patent shown at right. To start, let's see the motivation and challenges in creating a capsule-based medical diagnosis framework. While the memory-saving techniques introduced in SEGCAPS allow us to perform segmentation on high-dimensional inputs, classification at these sizes still remains an issue. Existing capsule-based frameworks for medical diagnosis utilize CAPSNET's original fully connected capsules, forcing these methods to rely on inefficient sliding window-style approaches to perform to handle the larger input sizes in medical imaging. To overcome this, we introduce a capsule average pooling algorithm to create a more efficient classification network. Our chosen application is colorectal cancer diagnosis on poorly localized or in the wild polyps. First, some quick details about this chosen application. Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer diagnosed in men and women and is the second highest cause of cancer deaths in the United States. Typically, colorectal cancer begins as polyps, which can grow into invasive carcinomas. Each year, more than 140,000 people are diagnosed, and there has been a recent increase in the diagnosis of people under the age of 50. And most importantly, catching it early increases the chances of patient survival with only a 10% survival rate if not found until a later stage. Previous studies on colorectal polyps have focused on limited, well-curated data sets, such as the one in the video shown at left. While these studies show promising results, polyps are not always perfectly localized with thousands of frames of video available for every single polyp. In this study, we choose to focus on more diverse and challenging data, illustrated by the two examples shown at right, with the red arrows highlighting the polyps to be diagnosed. Looking at this in a bit more detail, previous data sets contained a limited number of polyps, typically with not much variation in the way they are captured, and a large amount of data for each polyp with usually over 1,600 frames of close-up video, all providing complementary information on, from multiple viewing angles, modalities, focus modes, and lighting conditions to help create an optimal diagnosis. Our In the Wild data set contains far more, typically non-localized polyps, with just a single image per imaging mode, and often only a single imaging mode provided to make our prediction for a diagnosis. Combining these challenges with the large scale skew and illumination changes shown in the examples on the previous slide, and this quickly becomes an incredibly difficult task. And that brings us to our hypothesis for this chapter. Given the preliminary evidence that capsule networks can better generalize to unseen poses, and require less data for training, we hypothesize that a capsule network, a capsule-based diagnosis network, should be able to better handle the relatively limited training data and high intraclass variation present in this colorectal polyp data set. To perform diagnosis on our high-dimensional imaging data without resorting to inefficient sliding windows, we implement a capsule average pooling layer to create a more efficient classification network in a similar manner to how global average pooling layers work in convolutional neural networks. We reduce the dimensionality of our features by computing the average capsule activations and poses across spatial dimensions and within capsule types. Then we restructure these into a single set of class capsule prediction vectors. This works by computing the vector mean across the height and width of the capsule grid preserving the length of capsule vectors within each capsule type. Finally, we perform diagnosis by taking the magnitude of our restructured class prediction capsules. We call our capsule-based diagnosis architecture DCAPS. First, we input a high dimensional image of a colorectal polyp to a relatively deep capsule network made entirely of capsules. At the end of the network, we apply our proposed capsule average pooling layer, which forms our class prediction capsules. Following this, the magnitude of each capsule is computed to predict the output diagnosis, while the highest scoring class capsule is sent to the reconstruction subnetwork for regularization. 
To test our method, experiments were conducted on the Mayo Pollock data set collected, collected at the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville by Dr. Wallace and his colleagues. It contains 963 polyps from standard and dual focus colonoscopes with both white light and narrow band imaging settings. We conducted three sets of experiments, hyperplastic versus adenoma, which is the most common experiment conducted in the literature, hyperplastic versus adenoma and serrated, which is clinically meaningful as hyperplastic polyps are benign and can be safely left in situ, while adenoma and serrated polyps can be cancerous, can become cancerous and must be resected. And finally, hyperplastic versus serrated, where serrated polyps are typically left out of most studies since they can appear visually similar to hyperplastic polyps, causing many automated algorithms to have difficulty in distinguishing them. The results of our experiments show that DCAPS is able to significantly outperform the previous state-of-the-art method based on Inception V3, improving performance by 17 27 and 43% relative accuracy increases on these three tasks of increasing difficulty. We also conducted ablation studies on the components of our proposed method and found that three routing iterations again perform the best empirically. The reconstruction regularization was significant in helping our overall performance and that localization is of critical importance for obtaining an optimal diagnosis. For this, we asked our collaborating physician to select a subset of 100 more ideal cases where the polyps are better localized in the frame by the colonoscopist. Although we're still only given a single image, we obtained significantly improved results, getting us closer to clinically acceptable levels. So in this chapter and in the medical imaging domain in general, we often have limited training data with potentially a large degree of variation within and not across classes. To kind of illustrate this point, we can think of the intra-class and inter-class variation for classifying cats versus airplanes. Then think of the intra-class and inter-class variation for malignant versus benign polyp. Now, DCAPS represents an important step towards a more clinically viable computer-aided diagnosis system showing it can better handle these types of real-world challenges better than a uh, state-of-the-art CNN. However, there is still a more significant barrier to the adoption of computer-aided diagnosis systems into routine clinical workflows. And that's the main subject of Chapter 4, Encoding Capsules for Explainable Predictions, which focuses on creating a capsule-based network which falls under the umbrella of explainable AI and is related to the publication, patent, and funded grant listed at right. Core ideas from this chapter were embedded into Dr. Bakshi's NIH NCI R01 grant, which was funded with a high score for $2.1 million and found to be extremely innovative. Now, explainability is crucial for medical imaging diagnosis. As mentioned, DCAPS was an important step towards a more clinically viable computer-aided diagnosis system but the lack of explainable predictions remains a significant barrier, evidenced by the fact that CNN-based CAD systems have largely not been adopted into routine clinical workflows, despite their performance often significantly exceeding that of human doctors. This is not limited to the healthcare domain either. A similar hesitancy is seen in many high-risk applications, including military, security, transportation, finance, legal, and more. Every time, this reluctance of adoption is cited back to a lack of trust caused by the highly uninterpretable nature of so-called black box CNN models. Recently, there's been a large push for explainable AI. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency has invested billions over the past few years into explainable AI. The Transportation Department is calling for explainable AI and self-driving cars. The Patent and Trademark Office is calling for explainable AI and systems for improving its patent approval process. And Elham Tabasi, the Acting Chief of Staff at the National Institute of Standard and Technologies Information Technology Lab, and lead author of the NIST report on a common set of AI principles, 
which has now been signed on to by over 40 countries, including the United States, had this to say. We need them to be explainable rather than just give an answer. They should be able to explain how they derive that prediction or to that decision. That goes a long way on increasing trust in the system. In machine learning, there's a known trade-off between model interpretability and predictive performance. While some work has been done to make CNNs more explainable, their success has been relatively limited and typically comes at the cost of worsened performance. Capsule networks, on the other hand, have shown an innate ability to encode visually interpretable features without suffering from degraded performance. With that motivation, before moving on to discuss our proposed explainable capsule network, I, knew, I do need to take a brief aside to distinguish between model interpretability and explainable predictions, since these terms are often used interchangeably. In the context of this work, interpretability deals with the post hoc analysis of the inner workings of a model in relation to its predictions, such as grad cam and saliency maps, or blacking out parts of the input to see how it changes the output. Explainable methods, on the other hand, provide explanations for their predictions when they are making them. The argument for explainable predictions over post hoc interpretations is this. Instead of a model predicting this is a picture of a cat, and a researcher trying to break down the neural activation patterns of what parts of the image are activating what parts of the network, what end users would really prefer is for the model to explain its predictions just as a human would. We call this human level explainability. When asked why is this a cat, a human would not vaguely point to regions of the image or parts of their brain. They would answer, it's a cat because it has fur and whiskers and claws. Humans explain their classifications of objects based on a taxonomy of object attributes. And if we want our models to be explainable at the human level, they should provide end users with these same kinds of explanations. And that brings us to our research question. Can we build a capsule network to model specific visually interpretable object attributes and form predictions based solely on their combination? As an application of this research, we chose lung cancer diagnosis Lung cancer diagnosis is a perfect application within medical imaging diagnosis because radiologists already explain their predictions for nodule malignancy based on a taxonomy of nodule attributes, including subtlety, sphericity, margin, lobulation, speculation, and texture. To solve this problem, we propose an explainable multitask capsule network. An object, in this case a lung nodule, is input to our three-layer 2D capsule network to form attribute prediction capsule vectors. Each of these vectors is supervised to encode a specific visually interpretable attribute of the target object, where the dimensions of each vector capture the possible variations of that attribute over the data set, and the magnitude of that vector represents that attribute's presence, or in our case, its score. Then, we predict the nodule's malignancy by passing these visually interpretable capsules through a linear function and apply a softmax activation to create a probability distribution over malignancy scores, while also passing them to a reconstruction branch to perform regularization. Now, you may have noticed for creating these attribute capsules, unlike in CapsNet where parent capsules were mutually exclusive, for example, a prediction of the digit five cannot also be the digit three. For our parent capsules are not mutually exclusive of each other, where a nodule can score high or low in each of the attribute categories. For this reason, we modify the dynamic routing algorithm to independently route information from children to parents through a routing sigmoid function. Where the original routing softmax employed by CapsNet enforces a one-hop mapping of information from children to parents, our proposed routing learns a non-mutually exclusive relationship between children and parents to allow multiple children to be emphasized for each parent, while the rest of the dynamic routing procedure follows the same as in CapsNet. 
Typically, in lung cancer, uh, lung nodule classification data sets, a minimum of three radiologists provide their scores on a scale of one to five for nodule malignancy. Previous studies in this area follow a strategy of averaging radiologist scores and then attempt to either regress this average or perform binary classification as above or below three. However, such approaches throw away valuable information about the agreement or disagreement amongst experts. To better model the uncertainty inherently present in the labels due to inter-observer inter variation, we propose to directly predict the distribution of radiologist scores by fitting a Gaussian function to the mean and variance as the ground truth for our classification vector. This allows us to model the uncertainty present in radiologist labels and provide a meaningful confidence metric at test time to radiologists. Nodules with strong inter-observer agreement will produce a sharp peak as the ground truth during training, in which case network predictions with large variance, i.e. low confidence, will be punished. Likewise, nodules with poor inter-observer agreement, we expect our network to output a more spread distribution and will be punished for strongly predicting a single class label, even if correct. At test, the variance in the predicted distribution provides radiologists with an estimate of the model's confidence in that prediction. XCAPS, being a multitask framework, has three losses in its overall objective function. First, for the reconstruction branch, we chose to only reconstruct the nodule region of the input masked by the ground truth segmentation. Then we compute the mean squared error between this and the reconstruction branch output. Next, for our six attribute predictions, we compute the mean squared error between the network predictions and the normalized mean of the radiologist scores for each attribute. Lastly, for predicting malignancy, we compute the KL divergence between a Gaussian distribution fit to the mean and variance of radiologist scores and the softmax over our malignancy output prediction vector. The total loss is the sum of these three loss functions. For simplicity, we chose to set our loss balancing coefficients to one for all terms except the reconstruction branch, which was set to 0.5 to prevent over-regularizing the network. It's worth noting briefly that engineering efforts spent to carefully tune these parameters could possibly lead to superior performance. We performed experiments on the LIDC dataset where at least three radiologists annotated 646 benign and 503 malignant nodules, excluding nodules of mean malignancy score exactly three. Our method was compared against the state-of-the-art explainable CNN for lung cancer diagnosis called HSCNN, which is a deep, dense, dual-path 3D CNN, as well as two non-explainable 3D CNNs and the original CAPSNET. The results of our experiments show that supervising the attributes learned within the vectors of our capsule network significantly improved our performance over CAPSNET while a CNN-based method, which built an identical explainable hierarchy of first predicting attributes, then malignancy, suffered from degraded performance compared to its non-explainable counterparts, as shown in the symbolic plot. Here are the quantitative results of those experiments, where our simple 2D three-layer XCAP significantly outperformed the explainable HSCNN on predicting attribute scores, while also achieving higher malignancy prediction accuracy, with performance comparable to that of the non-explainable deep multi-crop or multi-scale 3D CNNs. We performed three ablation studies, experiments for our study. First, we removed predicting the distribution of radiologist scores and instead simply attempt to regress the mean value of these scores. Next, we remove the reconstruction regularization from the network. And lastly, we replaced our proposed routing sigmoid with the original routing softmax from CAPSNET. The results of these ablations show that all three of these components contributed positively towards our proposed model's performance. That takes us to chapter five, where we discuss the conclusions from this dissertation 
and propose potential future directions for capsule networks. In chapter two, we introduced the first ever capsule-based segmentation network in the literature, SEGCAPS, while, produce, while producing several novel advancements, including locally constrained dynamic routing algorithm, transformation matrix sharing, deconvolutional capsules, extension of the reconstruction regularization to segmentation, a deep encoder-decoder capsule architecture, um, and, and, a, and a deep encoder, um, yeah. Uh, we validated the effectiveness and efficiency of SEGCAPS in the largest ever study in pathological lung segmentation and the only showing results on preclinical subjects utilizing deep learning methods and showed that SEGCAPS consistently outperforms all state-of-the-art CNN-based approaches while only using a small fraction of the total parameters of these much larger networks. Further, our additional experiments conducted on fluorescent angiogram videos and rotations and reflections of natural images gives compelling evidence to the advantages of a capsule-based segmentation method over CNN-based methodologies. In chapter three, we introduced a deep capsule network for medical image diagnosis, DCAPS, which was able to operate on high dimensional imaging data thanks to our novel capsule average pooling algorithm and showed significantly improved results over the state-of-the-art CNN-based method on the limited training data and high intraclass variation present in the Mayo polyp dataset, where we diagnose non-localized colorectal polyps from single images. Lastly, in chapter four, we created a novel multitask explainable capsule network, XCAPS, which learned to encode visual attributes within its vectors to provide malignancy predictions with the same high-level explanations used by human expert radiologists. XCAPS utilizes a novel routing sigmoid function to independently route information from child capsules to their non-mutually exclusive parents, while being trained directly on the distribution of expert labels to model inter-observer agreement and provide a meaningful metric of model over or under confidence supervised by human experts agreement. We demonstrated a simple 2D three-layer capsule network can outperform a state-of-the-art, deep, dense, dual-path 3D CNN at capturing visually interpretable high-level attributes and malignancy prediction, while providing malignancy prediction scores comparable to non-explainable CNNs. It's our hope that this dissertation will inspire future research into capsule networks, and to encourage this, we note a few potential research directions. From the technical side, Hinton cited the dynamic routing algorithm as critical to finally making capsule networks a reality. However, there is strong evidence that the current iterative-based routing mechanisms in the literature are significantly suboptimal, and we would encourage future investigation in this area. Further, we would like to encourage future researchers to consider capsule networks within the domain of representation learning and disentanglement, where there are some interesting parallels specifically to concept vector methods in particular. From an application side, we would like to draw attention to the fact that no studies have been able to show a capsule network achieving comparable results to CNNs on large scale classification tasks such as ImageNet or on object detection tasks such as on MS Coco. In our personal future work, we recently submitted a study which introduced a capsule network able to perform object detection on MS Coco which utilizes new deformable capsules, a unique split capsule detection head, and a novel squeeze and excitation inspired non-iterative dynamic routing algorithm. That concludes this presentation of my dissertation on the algorithms and applications of novel capsule networks. I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Bakshi, for all the advice, guidance, and support over the last several years. Dr. Shaw for co-advising me during my first year and for the great experience he instilled into me. And Drs. Mahal Nobis and Dr. Wallace, thank you for your commitment and support while being on my committee. Uh, to my funding support, thank you to the NIH funding subcontract, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Bakshi, uh, the Florida Department of Health funding, and the ORC Doctoral Fellowship. Uh, to all my lab mates, uh, thank you guys for keeping me sane and for all the great discussions on the research ideas over the years. Um, and to my parents and brother, uh, this work is dedicated to you guys. Uh, thank you for your unending love and support.
Um, so thank you everybody who joined. Um, if you'd like to view the code or the project pages for anything you've seen in the presentation, you can follow the links provided here. Um, and I can now open up to discussions at this time. Thank you, Rodney. Um, so anyone having question, you know, can raise the hand and I'm gonna uh, try to help queuing uh, the people. So, yeah, so any question for Rodney? Until you become volunteer, maybe I can ask, uh, you know, the joy of having the first question. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about also uh, detection of polyp uh, as well? Because you talk about the diagnosis, which you take the input of the whole image mm -hmm. or video sequences like previously Dr. Walls also mentioned. So if you do detection of polyps, do you think it is gonna improve the diagnosis? Sure, so that was uh, the focus of kind of that last set of ablations where basically we asked the uh, colonoscopist to show us examples where the polyp is well detected and takes up most of the frame, um, which is uh, an example where uh, Dr. Wallace mentioned kind of how uh, the colonoscopist, once they notice a polyp, can kind of move the probe in and actually get a good capture of it. Mm -hmm. um, on those examples, we get far better performance. Um, so it, we do believe it, it's very important to have well-localized polyps to be able to perform diagnosis. And I was actually meaning the auto-detection. Auto yeah, so, so for an automated detection system, um, I would be curious to apply our... Uh, detection system that we propose for MS Coco, uh, apply something like that to see how the performance is on medical examples. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that's needed is to, is to create a detection framework. Sure, so yeah, Dr. Wallace has a question. Please go ahead. Yes. Thanks and congratulations, Rodney. Uh, that was really superb uh, presentation, also uh, reflecting years of superb work. Um, my question is about explainable AI, and, and this may be more of a social science or psychological question, so I realize that's about a little bit outside of your area of expertise, but sure. using the term explainable intends that, that the user understands what we're trying to explain, mm -hmm. um, and we've struggled with the black box phenomenon. Um, when you look at how we're explaining, and in this mode of explainable AI, how well does that actually, how well is that received by, uh, let's say an informed user or, or even an uninformed user, maybe a, a physician who's not an expert in AI, uh, does the explanation of explained AI uh, ring true to them such that they can understand the variables that are being evaluated? Yeah, so I guess the big thing with explainable AI is, is there's kind of two pushes in the community right now. And one of those is to really try to explain to the end user all of the internal workings of these complicated nonlinear functions being learned. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of that push. I, I tend to like the push of, it's still kind of a black box on the inside, but it's final predictions that the end user is seeing is, hey, I think this is malignant and I think it's malignant for these reasons. And then the radiologist who is used to hearing that kind of language of, I think it's malignant because of these scores, can then look at those scores and say, well, I don't agree with this or, oh yeah, I mean, I agree with all those scores. And you know, so I have a little bit more trust now in that final prediction. And especially when we're giving it also a confidence of, you know, here's how much we think we're confident in this prediction we're making. Uh, both of those help a lot, I think, for the radiologist to be able to kind of trust the system a little bit more. And do you think it's important to explain it in terms of the traditional parameters or variables that a human would use to discriminate? You know, for example, in the cat analogy, the, the whiskers and ears and fur and a tail, do we have to explain that, you know, variable one corresponds to whisper, uh, whiskers and variable two corresponds to uh, fur and, and that sort of item, but, or do you think it's okay to just say that a variable one uh, is a new parameter that's associated with, um, with some other finding? Sure, so, so this is actually um, 
in our work, we explicitly supervise variable one is this, variable two is that. Uh, in the original CAPSNET, there was no explicit supervision. And the researchers just went in and saw, hey, if I mess with variable one, what does that affect? And they were able to find, oh, okay, that affects the rotation. Variable two affects the stroke thickness. Variable three affects this and that. The advantage of an unsupervised or partially supervised system is you can do kind of exactly what you're implying of, hey, we didn't supervise it, it found something, and let's examine what exactly it's doing. And then we can kind of hopefully extrapolate, this is the, the dream, we can hopefully extrapolate new imaging biomarkers for whatever it is we're classifying, if it's malignant or benign lung nodules, we can say, look, as we vary this attribute, this way it becomes more malignant, this way it becomes more benign, and we can identify new attributes where, you know, it was paws and whiskers, maybe there's something else that's, you know, very helpful to identify a cat. And again, it's all within the context of not just what makes a cat, right? It's not a generative network. It's what differentiates a cat from the other things that we're testing against. So it's what differentiates malignant versus benign more so than what makes malignant. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, thank you. So any other uh, questions? Um, I've got uh, two simple ones and then two kind of just general ones. Okay. So the simple one is when you use the house turf distance mm -hmm. for uh, computing the um, uh, the segmentation, mm -hmm. exactly how, what is it uh, that you're doing there? Are you just looking for points along the edges where the boundary is and computing a house turf distance to the ground truth? Is that what you meant? Yeah, it essentially, it essentially just computes the average distance between uh, the boundary of your predictive segmentation and the boundary of the ground truth. So, so you, you just find the closest points and, and you compute that average distance. Um, so in, in uh, just du in directional steps, right? Yeah, yeah, it just, yeah. It, it's a standard metric in, in our uh, area. That's uh, most right. studies will report. And then it's averaged over the whole image or all the segmentation Correct. Yeah, ground yeah, truth? The whole, yeah. It's one, one number for the entire 3D volume. Okay. Um, the other uh, question that I have is, um, so for your confidence prediction, mm -hmm. um, I understand how you're doing the, uh, the explainable part of it. That's very interesting. Um, but does that mean that the ground truth information has to have all of that put in by the radiologist or by an annotator that kind of ground truth is available to you already? So in our current formulation, yes, we're fully supervised. So we have to have attribute scores for each attribute we wanna study. Um, we would like to move forward in the future and do sort of semi-supervised where some attributes are known and then we also let it try to learn new ones. Um, but there are existing data sets out there in the standard computer vision community that have these sort of whiskers and paws and, and tail and stuff is cat. Uh, those data sets do exist in computer vision as well. Um, but yeah, right now um, those are and, needed. Yeah, and I guess uh, you kind of touched on what, where I was going with that. It seems to me like that this could lead to a possibility where there's a user in the loop learning going on because as the network is generating whatever the different measures are of importance to explain itself. Perhaps there's a user that can interact with them and say, no, this was, give it some guidance or put in new values. Uh, is that an opportunity for interactive learning of some sort as well? Calibration based on the user's preference? Sure. Um, yeah, so with everything, that's always an option. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know. know. I, I, yeah, part, I part of it, uh, Rodney, just to remind you, part of it, like, this user in the loop, like this grant also you mentioned, like this uh, with eye tracking, we still use X caps and capsule and the eye yeah. tracking is the way to in interact for radiologists with the computer. Uh, yeah, so, so my right. personal right. opinion is anything human in the loop 
should start at least considering reinforcement learning where you're basically you're you're trying to mimic some you know human behavior and then improve upon it uh, it's the same thing like they did with AlphaGo, right where they first mimicked humans and then it played against itself um, that's a strategy I personally prefer when you when you talk about human in the loop um, okay well, in the interest of time, let me just ask you the the general question. So I'm I'm extremely um, uh, happy and pleased with everything that you've done, and it's really a remarkable how well Capsule Network uh, you've made them work on these challenging problems. The one question that I have, which is which is something that I don't yet intuitively have a appreciation for is that you mentioned that capsule net networks are a really powerful way of you know, preserving the structure and the relative importance of location and shape. And yet for medical imaging, many of these things don't have specific shape, like a tumor is kind of like a non-specific shape, right? Uh, or for instance, when you have um, the segmentation job, uh, these are very, very, um, one of the difficulties with medical objects from what little I know about it is that they don't follow any specific shapes like we have in computer vision. Um, and also the patient, typically, you know, the camera is fixed, the patient is cooperating. So um, why is it that um, this is, well, well, let me ask it this way. Clearly capsule networks work better than CNNs for medical uh, seg image segmentation and classification. Um, what are they really picking up on? I know this is a very non-specific question, but I just wanted to hear your intuition about what might it be really doing. Um, so, so I do. Uh, there's a handful of things to, to kind of touch on briefly uh, with that with that question. A couple of parts. Um, so I'll try to be super brief. Uh, the the first thing is. Um, like you mentioned, uh, most medical imaging is very controlled in the way that it's captured. Um, and what's nice about that, especially with like segmenting the lungs and CT scans and stuff, is we don't have, uh, we have variation and it can be uh, very hard to deal with variation in, like you said, what makes a nodule malignant versus benign. But we don't have a ton of like background noise and clutter and all those other things that you see in natural images. Um, that I think is something that really helps us where if you give it something to focus on, it does a better job of capturing, but if it has to figure out on its own what to focus on, it can have a bit of a harder time. And this is why you saw like MNIST with the original caption, MNIST did very well on uh, MNIST, but it did poorly on CIFAR, um, where it had a hard time identifying what, what am I supposed to be looking at? Um, I think that's one of the biggest things with, with capsules is, is if they know what they're trying to model, they can do a very good job. Um, and that we tried to help them with that in our explainable one where we specifically provided the segmentations in the regularization branch to say, hey, this is the thing that you should be paying attention to. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the next part of it is, um, it's a bit of a misconception. Um, that like in medical imaging, that there's no sort of shape information or no sort of standards, right? We have these attributes, like one of which it's easy to see is sphericity. How spherical is the nodule, right? So these are, it, it is similar. Um, what makes it harder in some ways, like I said, it's easier in some ways to lead on the background clutter. But what makes it harder in some ways is the, Interclass variations between cat and airplane are massive, but the interclass variations between malignant and benign mm -hmm. are very subtle. Yeah. Right. So yep. that's yep. that's our difficulty here. So there's some ways that it's a lot easier of a problem, some ways that's a lot harder of a problem. So, but there are attributes, there are metrics of you know sphericity, speculation, these different things. Right. Um, so so they, they do exist, they are there, and the capsule networks can pick up on them. Um, obviously, because we, you know, we showed the with scores of predicting. Yeah. So, yeah, very good. Thanks. Yeah. So let let me also ask, since you know, all the members of committee have asked. So, um, general question: That why do you think, Rodney, that 
capsule network hasn't really picked up yet because uh, most of the work these days in computer vision and machine learning, all that actually don't use capsule network. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of, lot of hype and you know a lot of um, yeah. attention in the beginning, but somehow um, it's not really catching up. That's first question. Second is related to that. That do you think that these you have contributed to these important problems in medical imaging? If you could have in a way solve exactly the same problem at that level using traditional CNN, if you have to spend more time hmm. on those. Oh, could could uh could the problems have been solved just as well with a CNN instead of a capsule? Yeah, because that is what, uh, see that if you look at the, this year, last year, a third, you know, a year before, all the work, all the exciting results and mm -hmm. huge improvement is using CNN. Sure. Uh, um, so I think uh, there's two big problems with capsules that are kind of holding them back. Uh, the first one, which I mentioned when I was answering Dr. Wallace is sort of, they seem to, and this is somewhat speculation, but they seem to struggle with uh, what to focus on. They seem to struggle when you have large degrees of background variation and things like that, um, because they're trying to model the attributes within these vectors. And if you, don't have something like you just have sky or something like that. There's no such thing as the instantiation parameters of, of texture, of, of just sky. Um, this is something that Hinton tried to address in his latest work with stack capsule autoencoders where they sort of explicitly give it, these are the things with uh, that we're trying to model. Um, and that seemed to help a ton. Um, so hopefully as more stuff like that comes out, that'll solve one important aspect. The other important aspect is when you're scaling up to large scale problems like on ImageNet and like on MS Coco, you're dealing with a thousand classes and you're dealing with, you know, 80 classes in a detection grid of some kind. And, you know, when you have a, a thousand classes and you're trying to create capsule vectors for every class, all of a sudden the, the memory needed to create models like that is just massive. It's, it's off the charts. Um, so that was in our uh, recently submitted work on MS Coco object detection. And we did, we were able to perform sort of right there on par with the state of the art CNNs is um, basically how do you solve that memory issue of how do you still have capsules that represent objects parameters, but deal with the fact that you now have, you know, 80 classes at you know 128 by 128 spatial locations, um, so I hopefully our work will be accepted and hopefully that'll kind of spur uh, a line of research into capsules of hey look here is a way you can scale these up to the computer vision problems. Um, so ho hopefully I think those two issues being solved will really help launch capsules into what they're projected what they were originally projected to be, you know, all the hype. Yeah, I think that my view is that because of the simplicity of the CNN, so that is um, attracting lots of people and there's so many people working on this and there are lots of new ideas and that's why it's really popular and so on. Okay, yeah, that's it. I don't have any other question. Cool. Sure. So Thank any question from RU and, you know, RU students and other participants, PhD students, masters, questions? Um, I think, so there is no question and uh, Dr. Wallace needs to also leave a little bit earlier because, you know, he's going to see the patient. So I, ask all the audience to leave uh, so the uh, only panel members can stay.